Thank you. What, what a privilege to be able to be a part of what God is doing in the UK Fellowship. Thank you, Pastor Brown, for inviting me and allowing me to preach. Amen. Nigel and Carol Brown are a blessing to my life, doing a tremendous job here. And uh, I'm honored to be able to preach the Word of God. These guys are going to be sitting up here. If I say something good, they're going to, mmm, that's right. They're going to help me out. Thank God. Turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 13. In Nigeria, a zookeeper was killed by a lion at a wildlife park after he failed to secure the safety locks on the animal's enclosure during feeding time. The zookeeper apparently felt comfortable with the animal, left the gate open, and started to feed the animal, and instead the animal killed him, and he died on the spot. This man had a purpose that was to feed the animals and show other people, but he made a mistake that ended his life and stopped his purpose. I use that just to introduce the passage that we're going to read, because in the passage we're going to be looking at, a young prophet has a calling by God and a purpose, but he made mistakes. The Bible says that a lion killed him on the road. The point that I want to make tonight in the whole sermon is that your purpose in God is conditional. You must make decisions to help cooperate and bring it to pass, but you must protect your calling and your purpose. I want to preach a message entitled The Lion in the Road. First Kings 13, we're just going to read a portion of the scripture. And when he went after the man of God, that's the young prophet, found him sitting under an oak. He said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? He said, I am. He said, come home with me and eat bread. He said, I cannot return with you or go on with you. Neither can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For I've been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread or drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. He said to him, that's the old prophet, I too am a prophet as you are, and an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with you to the house that he may eat bread and drink water, but he was lying to him. So he went back with him, ate bread in his house, drank water, and it happened. So they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back, and he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, thus says the Lord, because you've disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread, drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. So it was, after he had eaten bread and drunk, he sat on the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. His corpse was thrown on the road and the donkey stood by it and the lion also stood by the corpse, the lion in the road. Let's talk about the potential of a life. The story of the young prophet is actually a pattern for every believer. 1 Kings 13, 1, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. God spoke to this young man and he had a plan for his life, a calling. Calling has to do with purpose and a task. And every believer here, every believer that is watching online, you have a purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. You are called by God to represent him. We are the body of Christ, whether that is witnessing, preaching, pioneering, being a missionary. You are called to represent Almighty God. You are called to help call others to repentance. In this story, God wanted the nation to turn from their idolatry and repent because idolatry would destroy the nation. Unsaved people are on their way to hell. And our call is to declare that to them the message, repent, change your mind, change your ways. God is saying, I'm trying to save your marriage, your family, your destiny. 
but your altar is wicked and must change. And whether that's witnessing or preaching, we're called to call others to repentance and we are called to make impact on other people. God touches people through other people. People are saved because someone else witnesses. Preaching makes impact. Decisions are made because the word of God is faithfully declared and, and it impacts them. If you pioneer, if you become a missionary, people are saved and called to the ministry. I want to show you a couple of photos here. The first photo, my wife and I went to a place called Launceston, Tasmania there. And that photo, I'm 21 years old, my wife is 19. And that couple, the very first couple that we got saved, Mike and Alina Cook, you see us there when we're all young, but Mike and Alina Cook are now preaching the gospel in Box Hill, a suburb of Melbourne, Australia. Next photo, years later, 1997, we went to South Africa. Sean and Cheryl Stellenberg, that couple on the right, they were saved in our house. God did a miracle in them, now preaching the gospel. Lieben, we first met Lieben on an outreach at his high school, came in and got powerfully saved. You, his story is in the, the book on uprooting rejection, and he and his wife are now preaching the gospel and with a, a supernatural touch of God. I show you those photos because God has people waiting for you. It's not just do the will of God. No, there are people like that. He has a plan for your life. And when you say yes to the calling and the plan that God has for your life, he will supply supernatural power to accomplish his will. God does what we cannot do to enable us to do his will. When this young prophet goes and obeys God, he cries out against the altar, the idolatrous altar. The king points at him to have him arrested and his hands withers. Supernaturally, God overcame that. He cries out against the altar. It splits this stone altar split and the ashes poured out. God does something supernatural if you'll obey him on any level. He supplies anointing, which is divine effectiveness. That is what we want, that when we speak, whether that's witnessing or whether that is singing, testifying, preaching, what we want is God to make our words supernaturally effective. Acts 2.37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We need God to do a miracle. 1983 in Fiji, a young man named Aparosa Navara, he was playing soccer, he was playing football for his team on Sunday. The field was right next door to a church and that church used to put a speaker outside and play the sermon while the pastor preached. Aparosa, he's in the middle of a game. He's about to receive a pass, but he heard the preacher say over the, the, the speaker, one day you will have to meet Jesus. Aparosa said, when I heard this, I felt terrible. There was a tense feeling in my stomach, and as the ball came at me, I couldn't kick it. So I turned around right then and there in the middle of the game, walked across to the church. The crowd thought I'd gone mad. They were yelling at me, but I kept walking. I heard the preacher invite people to come and receive Christ's wonderful gift of forgiveness and salvation. I kept walking all the way from the football pitch to the altar. My team was upset, but I told them it's more urgent to be ready to meet Jesus. Can you imagine that if you're watching whatever football team you want and in the middle someone hears a message of God? That is a miracle. I want to tell you if you will obey. This young prophet, he began to obey. He began to do God's will and God helped him. And right here I have seen so many people through the years begin to do the will of God. I've seen them get involved. They started to get involved in ministry. I've seen them begin to respond to the call of God on their life. I've seen many go 
out into the ministry for the first time. They see some signs of blessing. Some people are saved and delivered. A group, a core is established. A church is birthed in a city. I've seen missionaries go overseas and people get saved in another culture. A nation is impacted in some way. They start doing the will of God. But our story gives this lesson. We're not called to start doing God's will. We're called to continue over time. Roman, uh, Matthew 24, 13, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Romans eleven twenty two. 22, if you continue in his goodness. Colossians 1, 23, if you continue in the faith, but I have seen so many that started, they did not continue. The people who witnessed to me when I was unsaved, the people who baptized me on the day I got baptized, they are not saved today. Our wedding, if I showed you wedding photos on the man that stood with me, the ladies with my wife, out of all of them, only my wife's sister is still in the fellowship. The night Lisa and I were sent out, launched into the ministry in Australia, 1986, two other couples from our church in Perth, they were sent out with us. We all started in the ministry on the same night, but only Lisa and I are still left in the ministry. Pastor John Besano. He was warned by his father-in-law, stay true to Jesus. This is when he was first going into ministry. He said, John, only one in 10 uh, pastors will still be in full-time ministry by age 65. John Bissano, he said, that, that cannot be true. So he wrote down the names of 24 men who went into the ministry with him at the same time. And he said, by the time he was 53 years old, only three were left on the list. And that was written many years ago. I have no idea how many actually made it to age 65. So here's the point. If you want to stay on track over time, you better value your calling. There are some people, they, they, they feel a stirring and a call and a conference or a men's discipleship, but they view this like a career choice. You know, I could be a man of God, or I could be a nuclear physicist. I don't know. <laughs> Elijah passed by Elisha who was plowing and he took off his cloak. He cast it over his shoulders. That was signifying God has a plan for your life. And Elisha said, okay, but let me go kiss my parents. Let me spend some time with them. Let me get their approval. In 1 Kings 19, 20, Elijah said, go on back what have I done to you? You think I did this? You, you think that was a program? You think I'm hyping you? That, that's, the point of conference is not, I got, do you want to do the will of God? I said, do you want to do the will? <laughs> Woo, do you get excited? Like you, you wind up on the front like, what am I doing here? I, I don't know, I was excited. <laughs> Absolutely not. Elijah said, listen, I didn't do this. That is an awesome thing. Almighty God made a choice. He said, you better go talk to God about that. Never think that this is a human program. You better value that. It's an awesome thing. The night that God called me into the ministry, I have never forgotten that, and I never let it go. Obedience is what releases God's will. In your life, God told this young prophet, go speak to the king, cry out against the altar. And as he obeyed, it is obedience that unlocks destiny. Elisha, value your calling, but then he obeys God's commands and a double portion was released. But here, before we move on, obedience cannot be a one-time event. God help you. If you're old, God, I ever tell you about the time I obeyed the Lord? Yeah, Grandpa, but that was 50 years ago. 
And the young prophet, he started, but he got off track. Let's talk secondly about getting off track. The story of the young prophet is a picture of someone who didn't continue doing what God wanted. Verse 19, so he went back with him. God said specifically, don't go back the same way you came, but he did. And he was judged and he was killed. What God planned, the incredible potential of his life was killed by a lion in the road. The plans of God stopped. And that is what happens to so many people. They wind up going back or getting off track. Some get off track because they get involved in sin. You can let sin in through compromise, small areas of disobedience. Think about this story. God kills him for eating bread and drinking water. That's a rough rule. But God is making a point. This is what so many people do. It's just such as, it's only bread. It's only water, but they open the door. It grows and gives entrance to the power of hell. Genesis 4, 7. If you don't do what's right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you or to eat you up. And I see people that they start compromising. And it grows larger. You let sin in through reasonings of entitlement. You know why so many people get off track? Because in their mind they say, I deserve this. So much immorality and adultery starts with this. My wife, my husband, they don't understand me. I deserve love, don't I? We've given up so much to do God's will and we're struggling financially. John 12, 6, the New Century Version, but Judas didn't really care about the poor. He said this because he was a thief. He was the one who kept the money box that he often stole from it. And I can tell you from dealing with dishonest thieves through the year, it's not that they're slobbering, greedy fool. They think, I'm sacrificing. It's okay because I am sacrificing for God. You let sin in through emotions. Ephesians 4, 27, don't give the devil away to defeat you. Through life, so many people, I've seen them get off track because they got bitter. You do your best for people, they'll treat you badly. So what? Do you know what they did? It's not worth going to hell over. It's not worth losing your destiny over. Let it go. I see people in their minds, they're confused. They become angry at God for what they don't understand. Why did God let that happen? Why didn't he? I don't know. But it's not worth losing your destiny. Ruth 1.20, the New Living Translation, don't call me Naomi, just pleasant. Instead, call me Mara or bitter, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord brought me home empty. Don't call me Naomi. Or why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer? And the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me. I've seen it again and again. People, they're wrestling. Why? I don't know. But don't lose your destiny over a mystery. Don't go to hell over a mystery. I see other people, they get off track because they start doing things that God doesn't want them to do. I see people that they started doing the will of God. And it's not that they had a sex change operation and they're, you know, a transgender drug dealer these days. They're just doing something else. T.L. Osborne had an incredible miracle ministry in Holland in the 1950s. You ever seen that video of the Holland Wonder? 80,000 people. I preached in that park. We had a few less than 80,000. 80,000 even older Dutch people, powerful, mirror. 
it's unbelievable, the miracle ministry. But later in life, T.L. Osborne and his wife, they started preaching the gospel of health food, and he started selling vitamins. Vitamins, they're not from hell. Some of them smell like it, but they're not from hell. But T.L., that's not what God called you to do. I see people, they pursue their hobbies. They pursue recreation. It's not evil. Building businesses, that's not evil if that's what God called you to do. Building a successful career, that's not evil. But maybe that's not what God called you and told you to do. Colossians 4, 17, say to Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. That's the only way you're going to stay on track, what God told you to do. You better still keep doing it over time. Some get off track through the desire for comfort. What got this young prophet off track? It wasn't drugs or alcohol. It was a desire for comfort. Come home with me and eat and drink. Verse 19, he went back with him, ate bread in his house, and he drank water. The normal needs and desires of life can dominate our decisions until we put them higher than the will of God. Money. You need money to survive. Pay the bills. Have some savings. Buy things that make life comfortable. But I see people that they put money in a place that's never meant to be. I can't do the will of God. I need a house. How can I survive unless I own a house? I need a nicer house, a better house. This old house, I need to remodel this house. Security. I've seen people, I'm 40. I don't want to live under a bridge when I get old. What's going to happen in my future? And so they orient their life for security instead of what God told them to do. And some get off track through the need of approval. I talked about people pleasing in my first message. The reality of life is you're going to have old prophets enter your life. And they're going to pressure you. You know what I think you should do? Come home with me. They'll use words of manipulation, mockery, anger, tears. And often what they want is not what God wants you to do. Verse 17, for I've been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. I wonder if this young prophet, I wonder if he thought, Man, this guy is an old prophet. I want him to like me. I want him to respect me. I, I know what God said, but I don't want this guy to think I'm weird. I've seen people stirred to go overseas, stirred to leave their church and pioneer, only to have an old prophet say, Don't be stupid. You'll never have what you have right now. You'll never get it again. And they listen to the old prophet instead of God because they want that person to think well of them. You know what? Life is filled with choices. You have to choose to serve God, which means you have to say yes to the will of God. The young prophet, he had the first part right. He said yes to some things. God said, go speak to the king. Cry out against the altar. He did do that. You have to say yes to God and whatever he's telling you this week. Calling. Romans 12, 1 in the New Century Version. So brothers and sisters, since God has shown us great mercy, I beg you, offer your lives as a living sacrifice to him. You know, this is ultimately what God wants from you. Does he want your money? Yes. Does he want your talent? Yes. But what he really wants is you. That's what that means. God, you can have me. What do you want me to do? You can have my life. You have to say yes to the will of God. That's a choice. But you also have to say no to certain things. Those sinful reasonings of entitlement. 
and emotional decisions. You have to say no. My emotions that are crying out, give in, you feel it. So no. My desire for comfort and security, no. My desire for approval, no. You have to continue over time. Let's talk finally about the dividing place. This story, let's be honest, is strange, isn't it? A young prophet dies. And the old prophet who helped get him killed lives. Is there any of you, you understand that? Shouldn't it have been that God should have killed the old prophet first? How dare you? It's a weird story. I, I can't answer all those things. I will tell you this. The lesson is it is possible for what God has planned for you and what he has called you to do to be killed. Verse 24, when he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. The blessing of God that God was helping him as he obeyed, it stopped. That prophetic gifting that could have blessed so many people, it stopped. The future people who could be helped, I showed you just three couples that my wife and I have had the privilege of being a part. God has people like that for you, but listen, you get off track, that will be killed. And only God knows the people that are lost when we get off track. Matthew twenty two fourteen. for many are called, but few are chosen. The young prophet dies, the old prophet who helped kill him he lives. You know what? Everyone's life is used by God. There are people this week, they, they've given reports because they surrendered. They are inspiring some of you. Yes, I want to, if they could do it, I want to do the will of God. That's great. But there are other people here. You're going, nah, it's career and comfort and my emotional decisions you also will be used by God. Some people are used as an example of what we should be. Thank God, I want to be like my pastor. I want to be like that man who preached. Thank God. But there are other people. They also are used as an example of what we should not be. 2 Timothy 4.10 for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, having departed for Thessalonica. I've known lots and lots of people through the years. There are many people, I thank God for them, that they are partners. I said, I appreciate Pastor Nigel Brown and, and Carol doing the will of God. We're, part, we're friends, but we're partners. I thank God for men of God that inspired me, believed in me. Thank God. But there are other people I also thank God for them because they showed me through the years, I don't want to be like you. I know clearly what not to be because of some old prophets. The story says the lion killed him. But then when they come on the road, the lion didn't maul him. It didn't eat him. There's a donkey, didn't kill the donkey. When they come, the lion just stays in the road waiting. That's not natural. But God is saying something. It shouldn't be this way. It should not be that your destiny die. It should not be that the potential God has in your life be killed. But that's the young prophet. That's what happened to him. Then there's the old prophet. Do you know what? 
if you don't do right, you can damage other people's destiny. You can help keep other people. The old prophet was the cause of the young prophet's death and destruction. Why? Was it envy? I've seen old prophets. They're like that. I had, I was ridiculously young when I went in the ministry. I began, I'm so excited. I had men of God. I wanted to be like them. Man, they were inspiration. But the moment I started doing right, they hated me. How dare. Was that the old prophet? Did he, how dare this young pup have a good future? How dare other people say nice things about him? Joseph's brothers, the Bible said they envied him. 1 Samuel 18, 9. So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Let me ask you something. This week you've heard your brothers give good reports. Have you afterward, after church, when you're eating a meal, did you have to say something bad about them? Man, that guy, he had a great report. You hear about that, Billy? Yeah, I hear he has a bad marriage. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I hear. Yeah, I hear he's mean to puppies. Oh, yeah, that's... <laughs> then there are people who discourage others from doing God's will. Deuteronomy 1, How can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we saw the sons of the giants there. One of our concert directors many years ago at the church, he was standing there. I don't know what he was looking at, but he was looking out the window and a bitter old prophet a man who had come back for redirection and rather than be a help and a blessing, came up behind him as he's looking out the window, knowing he would soon be launched out. He said in his ear, soon this is going to be you looking out the window of your church, waiting for people that will never come. Man, with friends like that, who needs the devil? Is that, is that going to be you? Do you discourage people who say, I want to do God's will? Those who set a bad example, they don't pray, they're not faithful. Those who give carnal advice, someone young is excited, slow down, don't burn out, secure your future first, then do the will of God. This old prophet, that's all he did was hurt. And then when he dies, what does he say? Bury me with him. Because he understood he was a better man than I am. When he was doing right, that's what I was supposed to be. This story is sad. I can't give you a happy ending. There is no, and they all kissed and made up and did the will of God and lived happily ever that's not what happened. There is no happy ending for the young prophet or the old prophet. So that means we have to look beyond both of them. What we need to do is find in the Bible an example of a faithful prophet. And I think an excellent example is Elijah. In Elijah, we see the power of faithfulness in his life and ministry. He started in obedience giving God's message to King Ahab. He moved with God's promptings, sensitive to God's moving. When God said, go to Cherith, go to Zarephath, he obeyed that, it was sensitive. He trusted God to meet his needs in the middle of the desert, in a foreign country. He knew how to pray down the power and break the drought. He ministered beyond natural limits and prejudice. He faithfully ministered to a foreign woman, had a supernatural dimension on his life that brought life to a dead young boy, had boldness to face the wickedness and prophets of Baal. And even when he got discouraged and said foolish things, God, there's no point in me going on, you might as well kill me. But when God spoke to him, he could repent and get back on track. 
And finally, he could pour his life into someone else. That is the joy of life. Don't just do right for yourself. Pour your life. Let your joy be, I helped someone else do the will of God. But you know what's best of all, out of all those things of Elijah? He went out of this life with fire. 2 Kings 2.11, as they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. My brothers and sisters, that is how we want to go out with fire, not with ice. Still to be on fire for God at the end of our lives. I wanted to put the, a picture up on the screen. This picture of his name is John Harper. He was a, a, a Scottish pastor. A friend of his said he was a man who craved for souls. A fellow evangelist said, I can say no pastor, teacher, evangelist ever moved my inner being more than the pleading and preaching of John Harper. He was always on fire for God and souls. How often I heard him say when laying on his face praying, oh God, give me souls or I'll die. 1910, he went to America and preached for three months at the Moody uh, Church in Chicago, Illinois. The meetings went so well, they invited him to come back for another three month uh, of meetings. So in April of 1912, John Harper boarded a ship sailing for America called the Titanic. You know what happened? Sailing to America, the Titanic hit an iceberg, began to sink. And they said, women and children first. John Harper was traveling with his daughter and sister, and while loading them into the lifeboats, he was preaching. Went into the water. And as he was floating in the icy water with only minutes to live, he was floating near another man. John Harper called out, Are you saved? And the man said, No, I'm not saved. And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And a few minutes later, Harper slipped beneath the water. Four years later, at a reunion of Titanic survivors, the man that Harper preached to with his dying breath told the story and said, alone in the night with two miles of water under me, I believed and was gloriously saved. I am John Harper's last convert. Man, thank God. John Harper went out with fire. The potential of his life, it didn't die. Last photo I want them to put on the screen. This is a, a photo of my father. My father, Pastor Wayman Mitchell, he began preaching in 1960 and he stayed faithful to his calling for 60 years. This photo was taken in March of 2020. It was the last overseas ministry trip he ever took to preach the conference in Perth, the Saturday before, what you see there is my father preached his last healing crusade in, in Perth and then preached in the conference that week. One month after that photo was taken, my father preached his final sermon. And a few months later, he went into eternity. <laughs> he went out with fire. He was 90 years old. Amen. Can you mention that? 90 years old, and on that night, he was still thrilled. People got saved, and people got healed. Thank God my father finished his course. But that is simply an inspiration for us. What about us? Is it going to be in a future conference? Is somebody going to tell 
a story and allude to your life. Yeah, they started with me. It's a shame what happened to them. Or are we going to make up our mind, God, we're going to start and we're going to continue until Jesus comes back or until the day we die. God, we want to start in fire and we want to finish in fire. How many of you, that's what you want to do? Thank God. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes.